All right, please join me in our call to worship. Come, let us follow Jesus together. To nourish one another in your living water. Empower us to blossom with your abundant, abundant love, healing, and justice. Help us to receive your forgiveness and healing that we will live transformed lives that bring transformation into the world. If you please, if you can, in body or spirit, please rise uh, to join together in the opening hymn. Be seated. Now, beloved community, I ask you to join me as people made in the image of God to come together and pray the prayer of release. Merciful God, we confess that we sometimes go through the motions. We just do our best to get through our days, our weeks, and even our worship services. Help us to live awake, receiving and sharing in the abundance of your love, healing, and justice. We turn to you now. Sorry for the ways that we have missed out on your gifts and missed out on being your gifts. And let all God's people say, Amen. Forgiveness is a gift freely given by our Creator, who loves us more than we could ever ask for or imagine. Receive the gift and be the gift of God in the world that needs abundant love and healing. Amen.
Good morning. Let us pray. Let us pray for the gift of understanding as we read and listen to God's words for us in the scriptures. Gracious God, open us to your reconciling word and your healing spirit as we listen to the words of Isaiah and Jesus this day. Amen. The prophet Isaiah brings God's word to a religious people who engage the routine and the ritual without seeking the spirit. The result is chaos, greed, and injustice. From Isaiah 1, verses 10 through 18. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who asks this from your hand? Trample my courts no more. Bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation. I cannot endure the solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Come now, let us argue it out, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Luke tells a story of Jesus interacting with a man who many of his peers believed was beyond forgiveness. And you, like me, when you were growing up, may remember the song about Zacchaeus being a wee little man and hiding in a tree. Keep that in mind as you listen to Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. Thank you, Steve, although I'm a little disappointed you didn't just break into song, because my head did, right? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. <clears throat> now it's in my head the rest of the day. So I'm guessing that you do not have to think very hard to come up with an example of Christian hypocrisy. Take that the chuckles are a yes. 
right? We do not have to. So, you know, in the spotlight right now, uh, because it, they get a lot of attention, I'm thinking about, as we head to midterms, various candidates who claim to be Christian, who use language of godly this, godly that, but then by almost every measure of how we understand Jesus, they seem to be treating people or espousing policies that represent the opposite of what Jesus did and said. But that's low-hanging fruit to focus there because people don't get to that role or place unless there's not a whole lot of people in pews doing the same thing, right? So I think about a time I was, I was reading this book and the man was describing the church of his childhood and he was saying there was this person who was a pillar of the church. This person uh, was a Bible expert in the sense, not necessarily of interpretation, but knew how to quote the chapters and the verses knew where everything was, knew the commandments, how they should apply. This person taught Sunday school, served on every single one of the committees, was in all the leadership positions. And a lot of people, when they thought of this local church, they thought of this man. And then the author wrote, and he was the meanest person I've ever met. And I think about, it's more mild, but in every church I've served, there are people who, to my knowledge, don't share words of gratitude or affirmation about the other people or leaders in their faith community. But as soon as one trivial thing is not to their liking, or a decision is made that they don't appreciate, they have plenty of words to say, to offer. And as if they're in a place of self-righteousness and they're just waiting for someone to mess up and then pounce on their perceived mistake. People do this kind of thing. And I'm thinking of all of this, all those various examples, because God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah, and the bottom line is God says, I hate that stuff. I hate it. Hate it. That's strong. I, got, I hate, I despise that kind of thing. There's this picture where God says, the, the ways that people live into self-righteousness and selfishness and hide behind mass of religiosity and so-called spirituality, I hate that. Now the context of this is the people in a time and place called Israel, and they have a story that tells them who they're supposed to be. They are to be a blessing to the whole world, a light to the nations, Isaiah will say later, and that they are to live in covenant community with God, with each other, and that they will embody God's love, justice, healing, hope, all the good things in the world. And that they will model this to other people who will then want to be in covenant with the Creator and with each other, and that this would make the world better. And that the people are offered abundant resources for that journey. They have stories and poems and songs. They have commandments. They have what gets called Torah, which a lot of times is translated teaching, but the word in Hebrew, Torah, has a sense of like a measuring stick. And the idea is you can look at those commandments to see how are you measuring in terms of your connection with God. Are we living into this or not? So they have abundant resources, opportunities for worship and feast days and fast days, ways to be connected with God and each other. And then they neglect many of them. They don't do it. They don't pay attention to God or really each other. And then they start to live in places of scarcity and fear and selfishness and self-righteousness. Now, don't get me wrong, they still maintain you know, what we might call their membership. They still show up here and there. But for example, they'd be the kind of people who are at the synagogue service, not really opening to the Spirit, but paying attention to the time, wondering if they'll still make it to brunch. Right? Just kind of going through the motions. Just doing what's expected. And so, in the ways that they're living this, though, they're disconnected from the power that transforms, that heals, that, that equips them to do what's just and right, and so they're not living into it, and that hurts them and it hurts other people. And so God is saying to the people, you know, all the ways that you, you act like you're religious or spiritual, but don't connect with my spirit, that's horrible, that's hurtful to you, to everyone. Now, all of this isn't to just condemn or scold them, it's so they would turn around. Pretty much every time a prophet is saying something that's hard to hear, it's an invitation to try again, to enter into something better. And that's what's happening. But it does a lot of damage because a lot of people don't turn around. And there is likely someone on the receiving end of such damage who is featured in our gospel story today, 
Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, we're told, is chief tax collector and he is rich. This is his whole CV that we're given. Now, last week, Pastor John, we had, the Bible has a lot of tax collector stories. And Pastor John, preaching last week, there was a tax collector. And he was sharing with us about some of why tax collectors were not popular. So, I mean, first, a lot of people don't like paying taxes. I mean, I hardly ever run into someone who says, like, I just love paying taxes, right? Even though we might love that Oracle got repaved, we'd rather there be some other way to pay for it than out of my own pocket. But, right, there's this grumbling, this kind of culture we don't like. So that's universal. But these taxes we're talking about in the story are not going to repave, you know, their own local street. These are the taxes that they're paying to the Roman Empire, the oppressive occupying nation. So this isn't just a tax. This is a tax to support, tax to support the army marching in your street who can occupy your home or take your women or confiscate your food. And you have to pay taxes to support that. So that's the kind of tax we're talking about. So the people collecting those taxes are not only unpopular, they're seen as traitors to the race, to the religion, to the nation. So Zacchaeus, he's chief tax collector, which means he's overseeing some other tax collectors. And it gets even worse because the Roman system, which worked great for Rome, because that's how Rome did things, what works great for Rome, is that the chief tax collector had to pay first the, the apportionment for the segment of the population they were responsible for. So they'd send in the tax money and then have to go and collect it. So there's a lot of pressure on those tax collectors to make sure you get the money back, right? If someone says, I don't have enough, well, then that's out of your own pocket. So there's the shakedown, right? There's the shakedown that happens. Also, the only way the tax collectors and then the chief tax collector make any money is they have to charge extra. They are going to make you pay more than you actually owe. Service fees, right? Like, oh, you'd like to fly on our airline on a trip? You know, we've decided now that luggage is a luxury, and that'll cost you $50 more. And if you try to shove everything into a carry-on bag, we're going to make you feel bad because our flight is full, and there's no room for your carry-on either, right? These are how systems work. Get all the money you can. So that's what's going on here. Well, Zacchaeus is great at this because he's not only the, he's the chief tax collector, and he's rich. So the only way he got rich as chief tax collector is he's really good at having his minions in the shakedowns. So no one likes Zacchaeus, pretty much is the idea in the story. And so people shame him, judge him, hate him. So that's the superficial look. But we see as we enter the story that something's going on inside of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, as in Jericho, Jesus is coming by, he really wants to see Jesus. And all these stories in the Gospels, I mean, you can think about the literal level of like, how would I draw a picture of this? But also, what are the symbols here? So the name Jesus means Yahweh or God saves. And so this idea, Zacchaeus is looking for some saving. Zacchaeus is at a place in his life where he's ready for something different. Maybe he is tired of the shame. Maybe he's tired of the guilt. Maybe he's weary of the alienation and loneliness. I don't know what it is, what, what made him hit bottom, so to speak. But he's ready for something different, for something better. And he wants to see Jesus. But we find out that the crowd makes it hard for him to see. And of course, on any literal level, crowds do that, right? Whether you're at the penguin feeding at the zoo, or you go to a concert and everyone in the front row decides they need to stand up for four hours, and so, right, everyone has to, right, you can't see. So crowds do that, because crowds are not necessarily sensitive to the needs of everyone else. And that actually helps us with one of the symbols of the crowds in the gospel stories, that we essentially have these, these three pieces of the population. There are religious leaders who are opposed to Jesus, who feel threatened by him. There are disciples who are committed to following in the way of Jesus. And then there are the crowds who are the uncommitted. So they're curious, they're hanging out, they're looking around, they're maybe going through the motions, but they haven't made a decision to be part of it yet. And so they're really blocking others from seeing Jesus. 
kind of like people who call themselves Christian but aren't actually connected with the Spirit, who live in ways that are disruptive and harmful and hurtful, and that keeps other people maybe who are yearning to see Jesus from seeing. We also hear in the story that Zacchaeus is short in stature. A wee little man, and a wee little man is he. But I think about, of course, in a crowd, I have a a good friend, she's 4'11", and she hates crowds. Right? She can never see or experience anything. And again, crowds don't say, oh, I'm sorry, short of stature person, let us help you. Right? They don't usually do that because crowds are a bit mindless. So she hates being in crowds. So there's that level of understanding in the story. But again, back to the symbolic. What is the story telling us about how the community perceives Zacchaeus? You shameful traitor. How do they cut him down? How do they see him, even though he has this important role in Rome, How do they make him small? And also, maybe he sees himself that way, right? His own shame, his own guilt, he's living small. And that makes it hard to see Jesus. But in spite of all these barriers, this tells us that Zacchaeus is really hungry for something, yearning for something, wanting this badly. And the sign of that is he climbs up in a sycamore tree. Now, if you grew up in churches, this story is so familiar, the shock value of that has probably worn off. But imagine, for example, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade in Manhattan. And there's a viewing stand of dignitaries. And because it's Manhattan, it's November, probably in long wool coats, and the dignitaries will have ties on if they're men. So imagine, though, one of those people didn't get a seat but is a dignitary and decides they really want to see something in the parade. And so I picture some guy in a, in a suit and tie with a long wool coat climbing up onto some newspaper boxes, getting himself on top of a, a police car parked on the side, holding onto a light pole, trying to get a look. That's the feel of what Zacchaeus has done here. That's how it would be perceived. So this is not someone now full of himself, right? This is a humbling thing he's doing in order to see, to open, to connect. And so then in the story we hear that Jesus sees Zacchaeus. Again, at literal level, right? He's in the tree. Oh, there he is. But of course, what's the symbol here? Jesus really sees Zacchaeus. I see you, Zacchaeus. I mean, after all, what's happened to a person in their life where they, you know, children don't wake up in Israel and say, I would like to be chief tax collector for Rome and have everyone hate me. Right? What's going on in this person's life that that put them or where they made these choices to get on this path? He sees whatever that pain or trauma has been, but he also sees the yearning, the hunger, the readiness for for new life or something more. And there's this whole crowd that thinks Zacchaeus is dirt, small, don't like him. But Jesus, full of God's spirit, really sees who he is and says, Zacchaeus? I want to come to your house today. Zacchaeus is inviting himself over to break bread. In that culture, if you broke bread with someone, you were identified with them. This person that everyone hates, that they think is unworthy, this this person who's so small in their view, Jesus says, I want to sit down at the table with you. This is Jesus saying to him, I see you, you're forgiven, you are loved, you belong. So now Zacchaeus, on top of the police car holding the light pole, but he has a decision to make because he doesn't have to come down, right? There could be this like, eh, well, I'm okay where I am. Oh, maybe I'm embarrassed that he sees me or called my name. Or I really understand tax collecting. If I get down there and talk to Jesus, I keep hearing he, he turns lives upside down. Who knows what that's going to be like? But Zacchaeus chooses to receive it, to let in what Jesus is offering. And he hurries on down and he comes up to Jesus and the crowd, grumble, grumble, grumble. I loved um, in the, uh, the gathering music Diane was playing, did you notice there was, it's really retelling the story. It says, the grumbling crowd. Because that's what crowds do, grumble, grumble, grumble. They don't see people. Zacchaeus has been seen and loved and forgiven, and we watch, he's already being changed. Zacchaeus says, you know what? I'm not just going to give 10%. That was the usual expected offering to the wider community, the tithe. Some of you grew up hearing tithing. I'm not just going to give 10%. I'm going to give away 50% of everything I have. And we're in the middle of a pledge campaign. Imagine more people doing that. Right? 
There would not be the usual church leaders wringing their hands during Christmas saying, what would we do with the budget deficit? But instead, there'd be a conversation about how many new ministries and missions could we start? And there's a powerful transformation happening for Zacchaeus. The person who was stealing from people, now giving way more than was expected. And he says, and if I've defrauded anyone, I'm not just going to pay them back. I'm going to pay them back four times the amount. This is a crazy generosity. And this is a story that's wanting to say, as soon as Zacchaeus receives this gift of forgiveness and love, it's already changing him. He's forgiven for then giving. Right? He's forgiven, and that's a gift to him, but it also changes how he's interacting and living in the world. It's going to be more generous and just, and this is the beauty of how the Spirit can be at work. And so I think for us in this moment in time, in the ways that we might at times feel self-righteous, I get that way. Why are those people doing that thing? There's this reminder that when we're judging, condemning, shaming, likely a sign that we become disconnected from the spirit of generosity and justice and love. And an invitation, turn around, still right here, can drink deeply, can see and be seen, take it in. And that each day as we do that, we can live more generously and justly, forgiven for giving to others in ways that transform and heal and hope. I was having... One of those, what, what National Public Radio used to call a driveway moment. Anyone know what? Yeah. So it's, this is before everything was on podcast and you could just listen later, right? If you're driving along and you're hearing the story, then you get home and it's not done yet. So you sit in your driveway in the car to finish the story. So this was happening for me. And the story, so this was, again, years ago before the podcast. So I'm listening to the story finishing because it got my attention. It was about a youth center that had been constructed in an urban, underserved neighborhood, and we were hearing about how it made an incredible difference for the children and youth of the community. And there had been, as I was listening to the story, these testimonies of now young adults who had experienced the tutoring and the care and all that had happened in that center. And they were talking about the story of how it got started and talking with the woman whose vision started it. And she was a third-generation person living in that neighborhood, a person not of significant financial means, but she was aware. She paid attention to the neighborhood. She's kind of a grandmother of the community, and she saw the reports of the failing test scores and the higher incidence of, of gun violence and people connecting with gangs and drugs and incarceration. So she didn't have a lot of money, but several generations back, some of her family, they had properties. So she had this vision of maybe on one of these properties we could create a center for the young people because the town's not doing it, the city's not doing it. And she could sell off some other properties and create some seed money. Now she didn't have the means on her own to do all this. She partnered with a nonprofit that did similar things in that state. And so she shared this vision idea, the nonprofit got behind it, and together they made it happen. And this youth center had been built, and it was changing lives in that neighborhood. And the interviewer asked the woman, how is it you who have often struggled and scrimped to get by, how could you be so generous? And she said, oh, honey, I talk to the Lord every day. I soak in his eternal life and grace and power. She said, so every day I'm on the receiving end of eternal life. Every day, there's some infinity in me. So, of course, honey, I have a lot to share. Amen. We are in the presence of the Spirit of God among and within us. Infinity, eternal life, creator of all it is. We can receive that, offer ourselves into that flow of spirit, and live more fully and generously. And so in this time of our worship of offering, I invite us to ponder and receive such gifts.
Gracious Holy Spirit, thank you for your transforming, healing power. Thank you for the gifts and the givers. Let us be part of your transforming love and reign in the world. Amen. As we come to this time of community prayer, I draw your attention to the prayer list that is printed in the bulletin. And if you would like a prayer request shared in this way, please be in touch with the church office. You can call or email, and Jen will include these, uh, which also show up in our PDF bulletin for the online worship as well. We continue to hold in prayer um, the friends and family of Chris Longstreet, who passed away recently as a result of brain cancer, part of the family of David Hugen. Uh, we're holding in prayer um, Joan Fazer's son, Tom, who's recovering at home in Phoenix after a recent accident. And you see a little image of um, Joyce Smith's new grandson, um, who's just born, but born prematurely, and so holding the family and the medical team in prayers and joy as well, because it's hard to be at distance during this anxious time. So please hold them in prayer. I will open us with some words of prayer after a centering silence, invite you to share your words of prayer. Uh, then we will have an uh, opportunity to listen for how God is still speaking together, and then we close out this time with uh, what's traditionally called the Lord's Prayer. Would you join together with me?
gracious, loving, healing, hoping God. We thank you for the gift of being in community together, whether here in this physical space, worshiping really around the world online. Thank you for the ways that the body of Christ is not confined to a building. That's always been true, but it's easier perhaps to understand in this time and season and place uh, that we live this faith, this love, this life in the world, and that that's what makes the difference. Thank you for the conversations we will have. In advance, we thank you for the conversations we will have today after worship in community. I think about stories and acts where the community was praying and talking together and then would say, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. So come, Holy Spirit. Help us to know what would be good to you, to us, and that would bring more of your goodness in the world. Thank you for our people and situations that are known to us. We give thanks for ways that we know that your spirit and the ways your spirit is embodied in people are at work. And there are other times and places where it feels more empty and unsure. We're feeling afraid or anxious. Enter in to our fears, to our grief. Thank you that you are the God who receives us no matter where we are on life's journey. And so we bring to you all of ourselves and all that we have, the joys and the concerns. Hear us now as we pray them, whether silently or aloud, and help us trust that you receive us and all that we bring. Thank you, God, for these words and this wave of love and these prayers. Help us to be attuned to the waves of your love, the flow of your spirit, in ways that we might receive how you're still speaking, ways we might be answers to the prayers of others. So we practice now opening to you, listening for you together, waiting in the silence for images or ideas or just simply in our own struggle or challenge to be still, and know that you are God and we are your beloved. So we wait on you now in this time of silent listening together. Gracious one, help us to continue to receive your daily invitation to speak and to listen, to lament and to celebrate, to sing and to take times of silence and solitude and community, to follow in this way of Jesus that nourishes us in your spirit, that we will embody what is good and just and healing in the way of Jesus who taught us to pray And we remember it this way, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in the heavens. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive our sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
If you have your little colored strips of paper, I invite you to, as we raise our hands in mutual blessing and receiving, go ahead and raise that up because we're going to be God's rainbow people as we do that, right? The people of covenant, so I invite us to go forth walking in the way of Jesus, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to know that we are beloved, belong. Jesus sees us and says, I want to come dine with you. You are mine, you are precious in my sight, and I love you. So go forth receiving such truth and embodying it in a world that needs it. And all God's people say, amen. See you in 15 minutes.